Okay. Good afternoon. Oh yes. Good afternoon. Okay. My name is Kyle Grady. I'm with uh, today with Community Table. I work. My regular job is with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and so I kind of volunteer my time on helping out uh, Community Table. So Community Table, what we want to do is build a local food system, uh, supporting new farming cooperatives in the Twin Cities. And the type of cooperatives that we want to establish are cooperative of small business owners that will connect the food system. And so each one of these uh, little blocks up here is a business opportunity for someone to work within our system. And so at the co-ops that we develop, like I said, we're, we uh, have a business plan developing uh, program. We also have a program that we help uh, set up the cooperatives themselves to teach people how, how do I come together as a cooperative. So the cooperative that we have right now, we have our Hmong, uh, Minnesota uh, Hmong Farmers Cooperative, which is about 17 Hmong farmers that have came together. They're all writing business plans. So these farmers are actually turning their farms into farm businesses. So that and they work together and they last year they brought in about seven uh, fifty eight thousand pounds of vegetables from these seventeen farmers. This year we're hoping to wrap it up to about two hundred thousand pounds of vegetables uh, from the farm. We also have uh, our um, cooperative of Latin American growers and actually they're growing and aggregating our vegetables. You can go on to the next side and so. Um, so I'll talk about as we go. So we started out actually doing some workshops. So hopefully some of you, so this is about local, will see some of your faces in some of these uh, pictures here. This is at a Gardening Matters mission earlier than part of Gardening Matters. So we actually did some outreach to Gardening Matters to, um, to talk about our project going to the next one. Uh, the Women's Environmental Institute, Will Allen, talked about growing power. So we're actually using some of his models uh, with growing power to do what we're doing. But like I said, using the cooperative model. Uh, this is uh, actually our workshop where we put on uh, two years ago. Uh, to ba basically start training our farmers on how to grow uh, locally here in the Twin Cities. Uh, again, this is our African farmers. My farm, uh, Siona no uh, Sochu, uh, is one of our African farmers that's leading our African farmers cooperative. Is actually planning to grow their vegetables. But our African cooperative, uh, they sell every every vegetable that they grow to the African community. They don't have a problem with uh, marketing uh, like some of our Hmong farmers. These are our Hmong farmers that go through uh, training. This is. Uh, the training that they did on uh, field sanitation to make sure that they wash their hands, hand washing stations in the field, so uh, about the gap training uh, that's needed in order to sell to institutions. And so we put on training. This is a field training, again, Will Allen uh, out at the Women's Environment Institute putting on some training. Actually, I think we're uh, doing, uh, building um, a, uh, no, the next one is uh, actually uh, some training on some youth at Siona out in uh, Brooklyn Center. Our farm is at the intersection of Brooklyn Boulevard and Bass Lake Road. Uh, where we grow oh, about eight nine thousand dollars worth of vegetables there each year. Watch the next one again. Just to some of the training, keep going. Uh, some of our other partners, the uh, landowner uh, Bobby Fern, uh, that's working with us. Uh, Derek Williams, who's a local chef, and basically what he does is does uh, dinners for diabetics. And so we actually can put together seven meals a week for diabetics uh, and, and using uh, the African-American recipes and things. And so uh, for African-Americans with diabetes, we can put together a full meal that you can go and buy. Uh, this is our greenhouse in uh, St. Paul on Rice Street. Uh, we actually, there's a 13-acre site there that we uh, grow outside and indoors at the site. Uh, working with young African-American youth uh, to work in the greenhouse to actually uh, grow seedlings. And, uh, we also do mushrooms there. Uh, with Jeremy McAdams, do farm for uh, host farm tours, uh, bees, and then we uh, actually take those seedlings and we set up. This is in South Minneapolis at um, a church there that uh, Gregory McMore helps us set up and uh, sell uh, seedlings. But we also have a farmers market there to sell the fresh vegetables too. Uh, this is Siona at, her, at a farm at the Brooklyn Center, Bass Lake Road. This is some of our African backyard farms. They actually have Africans growing in their backyards. So you wouldn't believe that deer actually get into the backyards, too, so that's why the deer fence is there. <laughs> yeah. This is the okra. This is uh, either uh, Chotu, one of our other African farms that's growing okra in her backyard. Uh, this is our greenhouse, Steve Lucker, uh, that's growing heirloom tomatoes. Uh, this is a farm tour that we put on uh, at the greenhouse a couple years ago, uh, part of the Urban Ag Tour. Uh, this is right here. Uh, this is uh, at uh, St. Olaf, Steve Lowen's. Uh, this is just interesting. Uh, for that, I just want to tell this little story. Uh, I grew some sweet potatoes because someone said that sweet potatoes couldn't grow in Minnesota. So a couple years ago, I grew sweet potatoes over at uh, St. Olaf, but I hid them in the, with the tomatoes so no one would find them. And so 
uh, as they started to mature, I would go over and start looking for them. And I noticed that uh, the first couple of plants that I planted, I think uh, about 15 plants, the first couple was gone. And I was like, man, something's digging up my potatoes. So the next week I go back, a few more plants be gone. The next, so the last week I went, I was like, man, I only got two plants left and all the other ones are gone. And I see this lady in a scooter because the, the garden or the farm is set up where people, handicapped people can go through in their scooters or wheelchairs or whatever. So I see her out there. I was like, ma'am, I, I grew some sweet potatoes over here and every week something has been taking those sweet potatoes. Have you seen anything bothering those sweet potatoes? And she looked at me and she said, son, I, nothing's bothering those sweet potatoes. I've been digging sweet potatoes for two or three every week and nothing has been bothering them. So I don't know what you're talking about. Those sweet potatoes are fine. I'm just glad somebody grew some for me. So. And so this, this is the owner too. She can grow some sweet potatoes as well. And that's all part of the Sparta Sweetie Pie that Michael Cheney had talked about in growing sweet potatoes for Rose Brewer. And this is the, the farm uh, the owner was planting earlier. And you see they planted these hills because they, they, these are some back-breaking jobs. So they plant on miles so they don't have to bend over as much. I always going to give a tribute to Deb Terrain, who was a longtime member of Afro Eco and actually got started in this uh, farm movement about four or five years ago. Uh, this is out at... Um, the Minnesota Food Association, this is some of the field hand washing stations that the vegetables and things uh, go through before they actually go into CSA boxes and things. And so we make sure that on the farm the vegetables are being uh, uh, taken care of and washed uh, for gap purposes. Some of our farm market stands for our, our farmers, they do this at Rice Street. And then this is in South Minneapolis. So basically what we found out was a lot of our farmers, especially our mom farmers, were growing more vegetables than they could sell. And when they would go to the farmer's market, if you would go to the farmer's market, when, you leave, when the farmer leaves the farmer's market, if he has so many vegetables back on his truck that you can't tell he's been to the market, I'm not sure that's a successful day uh, for that farmer at the market. And so when I was a kid growing up, I grew up as part of the Federation of Southern Co-op, so when we went to market and we left the market, our truck was empty because we had a contract. So, but those are some of the challenges that those farmers found, that when they left the market, they took over half of the vegetables back home, they would dump it on the field. And I would go and visit these farms, and, and there would be piles of fresh vegetables on the ground uh, back on the farm. And I would ask, well, what are those vegetables doing there? And it was like, well, that's what we couldn't sell at the farmer's market. And so uh, we have so many vegetables until we can throw this away and we can harvest fresh at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning to go back to the next market. And what we don't sell, we'll bring it back and dump it on the pile next to this one. And we'll do that for the rest of the summer. And so we found out the farmers were only selling probably about 30, 40 percent of the vegetables they were producing. And those had to be the number one vegetables, the ugly tomatoes and things. They, couldn't, they didn't even harvest those. And so one of the programs that we wanted to do was to help those farmers. And so we wanted to actually take those vegetables and see if we could freeze those vegetables rather than trying to market them because those farmers, they do a good job of marketing vegetables. And so our goal at Community Table is, is, is to take vegetables that can't be sold fresh and, and preserve them for winter markets. So if you think about Minnesota, the, the, the window for, for marketing vegetables uh, in Minnesota is for fresh vegetables is about three to four months. Uh, for frozen vegetables, you know, it's the, the additional eight months. So we can take these same vegetables and, and preserve them. We actually work with people in the inner city to take the vegetables that the farmers are growing and actually freeze them for winter sales. And so, and, and actually, there's no law against buying frozen vegetables in the summertime, too. And so we can actually, there's a 12 year, 12 month market for frozen vegetables. And so these are some of the vegetables that these farmers couldn't sell at the farmer's market. They brought to us, not only do we get the best looking vegetables that they couldn't sell at the farmer's market, but now we're asking them to bring their number twos in because a, a nice tomato, just because it's not perfectly round, makes some nice soup or salsa or something like that. And so you'll never know what that tomato looked like on, uh, when it's in that soup. And so this is what we're doing. And so, and essentially we have mom farmers that, that bring in vegetables to New York Plaza, which is a Latino aggregator uh, in South Minneapolis, and we work with European Americans to aggregate those vegetables to bring them someone to North Minneapolis to work with African Americans to do the processing. Nice. So, and so, uh, so again, this is our aggregation center in South Minneapolis. Keep it going. Now, so I'm going to rush on through this again. Aggregation. Some of our mom farms coming in. We also do some uh, food demonstration that Deborah was doing. Uh, and, uh, two years ago, this is at St. Olaf, where we first figured out that we could actually freeze vegetables. We bought tomatoes from Hmong farmers, went over to St. Olaf, used a commercial kitchen there, and made uh, sauce with uh, working with mad dads and, and, and some mad kids. Uh, uh, was, uh, by the time we got through with them, they were like, Mr. Kali, where can we get some more tomatoes to do this again? That's right. And so uh, this is, uh, again, this is at New York Plaza. Uh, 
in South Manapa this past growing season where we used a restaurant there to start with before we got Kendrick's Kitchen to do more processing. So we used to add a restaurant uh, three days a week. We're doing Now this is at Kendrick's Kitchen, so we got African Americans, Hmong, European Americans, uh, Latinos, everybody working together in North, North Minneapolis, freezing corn. We did corn, uh, green beans, tomatoes, uh, butternut squash, and uh, potatoes. Again, this is our picture of our processing team in North Minneapolis doing potatoes there. Uh, processing team. And then this is a, a, a meal, Lois, I think all of you remember Lois, who uh, I always going to give a tribute to her. So this was a meal that we sponsored, again, at St. Olaf's uh, a couple years ago, just to take, and these were the tomatoes that we used that we did a, a community meal with, so that we could show that we could grow processed tomatoes and then use them in a community meal. And the ultimate goal is to actually, like I say, to take those meals and put them into frozen dinners, frozen vegetables, and then market them uh, during the off season. And, uh, and using the cooperative model of small businesses. And, and that's, that's the challenge that we're facing is that, um, you know, the people that, that we want to work with, the marginalized people, not, they've never been offered an opportunity to start a business or to be in a business. They want a job or whatever. And, and you know, I don't mind offering people a job, but I don't want to do any W-2s and things like that. I just pay you to do your own taxes. That's the only difference between owning your own business and, and, and having a job, is whether you pay your taxes or somebody else do it for you. And we have a program that we're setting up to help you start your own business. And, and, and we use the corporate model because of the transparency piece, especially the financial transparency piece, because everybody can't make a 30% profit margin off of a tomato and expect it to be at affordable price in North Minot or anywhere in Minnetonka, you know, if everybody gets a 30% profit margin. Even, what, do, what do we mean by affordable? What does that mean? You know, and I work with the city on some corner store things, and I don't want to get into those. But this is what we, what we do at Community Table. We're starting a... a looking at cooperative of small business owners to put the food system together. And, you know, the system is already there. We just need to make sure that it's done in a way in which everybody is, is compensated uh, properly. And so there's a lot of people I want to, uh, Candace and Paris and Sean, just raise your hand. Those are some of the people, uh, Beverly, uh, that's with Community Table, some of the people, uh, yes, and, and Julie. So just the people with Community Table, that's kind of part of our little organizing board. Lots of people have been, been doing things with us. But over the last year or so, we had about 250 people that came through our Wednesday night uh, workshop just to talk about and help throw things at us. I warned people out and they left and never came back, but I do see them and I love what they did for us. And the ones that are here now, they're still hanging in with us. So uh, with that, I'll be around if you have any questions. Hey, Colleen, could you speak a little bit about your contract with the Minneapolis Public School? Uh, many of the public schools, basically we sold them uh, frozen squash and frozen potatoes. Well, not, not, yes, we did sell some freezing, but we actually did some processing for them. This year, uh, they've offered, we put a bid in to sell them fresh vegetables, uh, and so they've uh, taken a bid for cabbage and cucumbers. And so we'll probably be growing about 30,000, 40,000 pounds of cabbage and cucumbers uh, fresh for me after public schools. But I'm waiting for that frozen contract to come out because then I hope that we can get three or 400,000, well, I'm not sure how many pounds of squash and potatoes those kids eat. But those are the type of contracts and things that we want to get. Oh, I see Gregory over here too. So I, I, but uh, those are the kind of contracts and things. So this is one of our farmers that, that, that's working with us. Um, and, and doing amazing things. But yes, the Minneapolis Public Schools, that's not the only school. The private school system, the charter school system, the institution I'm part of the National uh, Farm to Hospital Program, that we're looking at how do we get fresh local vegetables into the hospitals and things. And we're also uh, working with a group of 40 restaurants that want to look at, uh, they're part of a wine distribution business, and then they want to put our vegetables on the wine truck to deliver to those different restaurants and things. So. Uh, but like I said, our goal is, is actually to help people start small businesses in the movement. And I have three banks right now, three funding institutions that want to fund our farmers. Agstar Bank, uh, USDA, uh, Neighborhood Development Corporation. But I've, I've asked our farmers not to take any of that money because the marketing piece is not there yet. When I run the numbers for our farmers and I see that we, we can't market those vegetables right away and, and I can't, we can't get the funding, on the end to do the processing and the marketing. NDC told us that we spend too much money on vegetables and on people and they need something to put a lien against to hold the money. I said, well, we got a warehouse full of frozen vegetables, put a lien against that and you can have all of that. But 
you know, those are the things that we face. Um, and, uh, and so now we're going to buy some equipment. They'll invest in, in us if we buy equipment, but we got to get those markets. And the only thing about the market is the choice that you make. If you spend $5 a, a week, like Ken said, on these local vegetables, then our farmers won't have a problem in going to the bank, getting those loans, and, and doing the business that they need to do, as well as the people in between, marketing, distribution, and all those people. They can get their business going. I'd be happy to take them to the bank to get those loans and make sure that they're, if you'll spend those $5. Woo!